Welcome to the Stare Ladies Podcast, where our mission is to get more people that look like us participating in the real estate industry. Whether you're a seasoned real estate pro or just starting out, there's something for everyone here. I'm Anita Wong. And I'm Tiffany Lee. We invite experts to not just talk about real estate, but also about our unique identity as Asian women and the cultural values that shape who we are as investors. Now let's get on with the show. The following is an important legal disclosure regarding the content of the Stare Ladies Podcast entertainment purposes only. The content provided in all episodes of the Sierra Ladies podcast, including discussions, opinions, interviews, and any other type of content, is intended solely for entertainment purposes. It should not be considered professional, financial, legal, or any other type of advice. No professional advice. The hosts, guests, and producers of the Sierra Ladies podcast are not professional advisors. The content provided should not be relied upon for making any personal, financial, or business decisions. We strongly encourage our listeners to seek advice from qualified professionals before making any decisions based on the content of this podcast. No liability. The creators, hosts, and producers of the Sierra Ladies podcast shall not be liable for any errors or omissions in the content provided, nor for any actions taken by any listener based on the information provided in the podcast. Any reliance you place on such information is therefore strictly at your own risk. No endorsement of investments. While we may discuss a range of topics, including investments and financial strategies, such discussions are for illustrative and entertainment purposes only. The Sierra Ladies podcast does not endorse or recommend any specific investments or financial products. Consult professionals. We strongly advise our listeners to consult with a qualified professional for advice tailored to their personal circumstances before making any investment or financial decisions. No association. There is no association between Sarah Ladies and a guest speaker or professional. By listening to the Sarah Ladies podcast, you acknowledge and agree to this disclaimer and understand that the content provided is not intended to replace professional advice. Now on to the show. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another Sarah Ladies podcast. I am Anita Wong, my co-host Tiffany Lee, and we are the Sarah Ladies co-host, and we are a podcast for AAPI female real estate investors. And today we are super excited because we have our friend Calvin Chen of Midas Wealth, who is a CFP certified a financial planner. Um, and if you haven't heard our podcast before, we've had his colleague Rick Hu who was on a couple episodes ago, and they are just such a great group. We just had to have them back to talk about different things. Uh, Kelvin, hi, welcome. Hello. Wait, it's good. Yeah. some more fun facts about Kelvin before we jump into it. Just oh, FYI, God. fun facts. Kelvin, as Anita mentioned, is a wealth manager management advisor with over a decade of experience in wealth planning. He's also a real estate investor and developer. So there's your SAIR tie-in. And he works with real estate investors and developers with minimizing taxes, saving strategies, and estate planning. And I think we, that that so he knows what he's talking about, guys. We we don't just bring anyone on the show. So Kelvin is a great resource um, for Sarah and and you know definitely for Sarah ladies as well. So um, without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, All right. So I'm gonna say one thing: uh, don't play poker, Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you take Kelvin's money? No, absolutely. Not. You know what? <laughs> Don't play pool with Kelvern. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You're um. You're, did you go pro, Kelvern, or are you just really good at, at at pool? Uh, I well, first of all, full disclosure, I am an amateur. I'm nowhere oh, close really? to a professional. Yeah, I always put that out front. I just enjoy. That's football. how he hustles you. <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> That's what the hustlers say. Yeah, Kelvin's like, hey, let me take two two balls off off the pool table. I'll give you a little bit of a lead, and that's how Kelvin <laughs> gets you because now you're not blocking his moves. <laughs> Nah, Tiffany always tell me, like, hey, I'll give you more chips to start. How about that? <laughs> yep. uh, okay. Well, um, you know, before we start, you know, I kind of want to talk about today's podcast, which is um, it's a bit about um, it's about scarcity mindset. And if you uh, we're going to be posting, he, Kelvin joined us for a virtual coffee where he broke down sort of different phases of um, of life and he offered sort of advice and in, in those different life stages so if you haven't caught that please catch that first because today we're going to be talking about specifically scarcity mindset and how it really applies to us as asian women um and and so uh my first question for Kelvin is can you explain what scarcity mindset is and how it typically manifests among real estate investors especially in the asian market Absolutely. And prior to that, as always, a full disclaimer, this is more like a, a general uh, conversation. It does not pertain any specific um, financial guidance advice. And if let's say you have any personal questions, always please feel free to consult your tax professionals, your investment professionals, and making sure that you get the actual guidance that's specifically catered to you. Now, back to our questions, Anita. Um, unfortunately, scarcity mentality 
um, it's everywhere. And uh, it's just that from personal experience uh, as an Asian, I just think that it's more prevailing. Um, I take myself, for example, a uh, real life scenario. I come from family of nothing. And my mom was a small business owner. Unfortunately, she still think that cash is king, right? Uh, AKA big mattress. And uh, is it still prevailing today? Unfortunately, it is still um, a lot from our clientele. And a lot of time is really just from the older generation, not just about real estate, but it happens among the Asian communities itself. And that's just a personal um, experience, speaking to your friends, clientele, and also some of the peers that we've been working with. And Anita, you had a great note about that. Like it's the older generations that are giving well-meaning advice, but it's coming from a place of, you mentioned like trauma, distrust of government, um, and it's it's hard it's hard for them to break out of that. It's well-meaning advice. It's coming from a protective standpoint, and obviously they want the best for their next generation. But we have to have that mindset shift now. Now that we're in more stable, prosperous times, how do we make our money work for us? <laughs> that's where Calvert comes in. Yeah, that's pretty much um, in the olden time. Uh, this go back to like all those the like the the two generations ago, the the upper upper generation people come to the states, and back then, if you think about it, that's where the communism era started to come in. Since China kicks in, um, the state government actually runs the runs through the whole country, so it's like just take money off from people. We're talking about World War Two, World War One, and um, the communist things that happened right in the seventies. So eventually what happened is the older generation, they have that wounds in their, in their lifetime. And they just think that, hey, you know what? Um, cash, I can just bring it, hoard it, and I can just run with it, right? And that's exactly what happened back in the past. Um, don't get me wrong. People still give advice based on what they think is in the best interest. However, they can only give you so much advice up to the limit of what they know, up to the limit of what they know. So yeah. they telling you that based on the experience. Um, has that been working out well? Maybe for them, but like Tiffany said, it may or may not work in today's modern society where the government is different, is more stabilized, and definitely having cash is eroded by inflation. I always say this, if you have a dollar now versus you have a, ten, uh, a dollar in the next 10 years, you still have the same dollar. The mm -hmm. nominal value is the same, but the mm -hmm. purchasing power it's no longer the same. So that is the thing that we want to make sure we address when it comes to um, scarcity mentality and what they, people think that, hey, you know what, how can I do better? And that's the reason why we come to this podcast together, right? You know what I love about this? The irony of this is that the older generations left the old country for a better opportunity in the US. And now that we're here, we can leverage those tax loopholes that this country offers now and all these other ways to build wealth. And they're still stuck in that mindset. It's like they don't, the skill set that helped you back then doesn't help you now. And that's a big takeaway that I ripped off from another podcast. Anyway. <laughs> um, Rick and I, we always say this what gets you here won't get you there. And what gets you there would definitely gonna be very, very much different than what you'll be doing. As long as your input don't change, your output will not change, right? It's just uh, a very uh, common uh, concept, but a lot of time people know it. They just cannot manifest and also put it in action, unfortunately. Yeah, I think about the story actually from another Share Ladies member um, who told me that like growing up, like, I mean, now that she's you know married and kind of um, understanding her parents financials a bit more which by the way they don't talk about i don't know about you but we i never talked about fi like finances with my my parents whatsoever and then you know it's like you're sort of like uncover all the things under the mattresses and like you know you're just like oh this is how you've been handling the money anyway so she found out that you know her mom was basically yeah essentially stuff like pretty much stuffing cash underneath her mattress and then she was just so mad because and she was like, if you just put this somewhere, this could have been, you know, it could have been like, you know, $20,000, like, you know, rather than what it is right now. It's like, you have to, like, you understand that, right? And I think a part of that is just like, her mom still doesn't even really speak English, right? Mm -hmm. And, and there's a lot of people that are still like that, you know, it's just like, it's, you know, it's really confusing concepts. Borrowing is a confusing concept. 
Um, and so trusting in these like financial vehicles is really, is really very difficult, especially when they can't, they don't feel like they're in control of, of their money. Right. So the best thing, stuff it underneath the mattress, at least I can see with my own eyes. Right. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you both and the viewers can uh, resonate with this. Um, unfortunately, there's this mentality that has been like, hey, I see it every day is real. I don't see it tomorrow. It's not real kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, back to where you started, Anita, is like um, borrowing in Asian uh, mindset in the past is actually uh, something that is not good, right? Something that is like only people who are not making it needs to borrow money. However, things change like Tiffany said. These days is more like how to leverage money to make more money, to make more investments more real. So I think that that itself is also a very, very big shift and change when it comes to the Eastern way of thinking versus Western way of thinking. And for me, I personally think that Eastern value living investment world, the number one thing that we need to really assimilate is definitely rip off the wall, rip off the hurdle so that we can actually understand how to really have the Eastern value sentiment, but work and incorporate the Western value and how to really understand the, the, the tax advantage. Tiffany like to use the word uh, tax loophole. I like to use the word tax efficiency. A lot mm -hmm. of time, uh, people who invest in real estate, people who invest in uh, stocks and bonds, uh, businesses, equities, uh, hedge funds, private equity, there is one thing to actually make money, but there's also another level on how to save taxes, right? So those things actually go hand in hand. If you're gonna focus one, not the other, it's almost like you're only watching your front window screen uh your windscreen when you're driving and not looking at your left right and also your back mirror it could be potentially be dangerous so that's something that i always want to make sure that uh, people understand always look at things holistically um scarcity mentality itself uh another thing is mm -hmm. also about hurt mentality hurt mentality mm -hmm. that one itself in the old days the hurt mentality is uh cash is king and everybody is like think cash is king but in the new way, um, I'm not sure if you, and Anita and Tiffany see this, people think that her mentality is almost like, hey, you investing in this? Or let me jump in. Wait, hold on. Do I know what it is? I don't really know, but people are jumping in. Let me jump in too. So in the stock world, um, during the COVID time, everybody is like, buy all this the meme stock, right? Not to say that you guys should or shouldn't, but I'm just saying what happened is that people jump into buying all this meme stock, making a lot of money, and then it's like they don't even know like what it is they just buy in and then it's like oh my god i make a lot of money and then the next day they lose everything so be cautious about her mentality as well it's just also very very a next cousin to scarcity mentality i like that i mean i, I want to go back to what you said about um having an east meets west kind of um well i suppose it's like how do we have that conversation right it's like you know, Asian money is typically very communal money, right? It's like they, parents save money so that you, for, for their kids, right? But obviously I think there's like a part of that is like control, like they, they see it as a collective um, pool rather than American values, which is a lot more individualistic. You, you earn your, you get a job, you leave when you're 18. That's just not, doesn't really exist in Asian mentality. Um, so how do you really have that like East meets West kind of conversation with people that are very stuck in um, that East? Yeah, that scarcity Absolutely. mindset. <laughs> yeah. So one thing I'm, uh, I hope most of the viewers don't resonate with this, but unfortunately, I think most will, is that how many times that we hear the parents say that, hey, your future is well taken care of. And then when you ask, like, so tell me more, you will know when I pass away. <laughs> like, so tell me oh, more. Wow. It is, right? Um, so I, I think that like like what you said earlier, Anita, is like parents don't really talk about financial much and they just don't like to talk about it. Uh, I think that it has something to do with um, privacy or they just really like very close up door. They don't want to talk about it. But the the oxymoron value that i'm seeing here 
is, like you say, most of the time, parents save their money, not spending it, is for the benefits of the next generation. But the oxymoron thing is that they don't talk about it, they don't let them know, and they cannot mm. fully utilize it, and then they keep it by themselves, and then in turn they actually say that, hey, you know what, all this money, I can see it, it's under the mattress, don't touch it because it's there. So I, I think that that's the gap that a lot of time we need to really have uh, just address the white elephant in the room, like what's going on? What you want to do, your intention for life versus what you're currently doing, they're actually not connecting. It's actually headbutting each other. And versus, earlier we mentioned the Eastern way versus the Western way. So one family I just mentioned is the Eastern way, exactly what I say. Another thing is that when you say communal, right? Let's just say a parents have four kids or three kids or one kid, two kids, whatever it is. The money itself is a big part for everybody. And it's supposed to be the equally, equally dispersed the same across, regardless of assets. However, this may or may not work in the Western world. And why I say that is simply because taxes. Like, let's just say that, um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith have two kids and one kid is actually a uh, business owners and another kid is a million dollars W2 income earners, right? Then obviously um, based on the taxes and everything, W2 is less tax efficient. Everything gotta be taxes on the dollar. If you're gonna be leaving everything the same and 50-50 across to the two children, unfortunately, yes, you're giving them the gross number is the same. Let's just say you leave them with 10 million, each get five. Unfortunately, when it comes to the one that is some assets go to the W-2, that person, unfortunately, because of high W-2, he's been punished. He or she's been punished simply because he's in a high tax bracket. Versus another person, uh, the, the other kids that is business owners, has a lot of tax efficiency way to actually get more and pay less taxes, legally, of course. So I think that in the Western world, taxes is one thing that a lot of time, Eastern mentality often overlooks. Now, some of my clients, if let's say they have like $10 million of properties, assets across different businesses and different trusts and things like that, strategically, number one thing we always ask them is like, who you want to get what assets depends on the tax bracket now and in the future, depends on what is their medical condition, whether they need any government program. And more importantly, we also have to think about what's their capability down the road. If that's going to give them a business versus cash of the same value, are they able to drive the business to the next level, maintain it, or you think that they're going to just pull it down all the way the next year? If that's the case, do you still want to give that 50-50 business and also cash to the two son or two uh, daughters that equally? It may or may not make sense. Or it's like you have to think about their capability. If let's say one son is a or daughter able to actually put more effort and know exactly how to run a business. Respectfully, I think that you might want to consider having 100% of the ownership in the business to that son or, or daughter. And then for another person who may or may not able to take care of themselves because they're not financially responsible or they just don't know how to handle their finances, you giving them cash is one level that's good, but a greater level is that you want to make sure that you're giving them an asset. They're going to provide them income for life so that they will be taken care of and they're not jeopardizing any assets that you leave for your family. So I think that having that mentality communal is good, but at the same time, it does not work too well in the Western world. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. It's like that. I feel like, yeah, to, to the point the Eastern strategy is like one size fits all. It's just save money, but they don't, they're not aware of like the mechanisms in place that can uh, really maximize and optimally what they have saved up. Like you've saved up all this money. Fine. Do that. I, I almost feel like the first conversation that's probably the easiest one to have with the Eastern generation, as far as these mechanisms is like, you have to pay taxes. This is how you save money on taxes. And that, that's when they're like, what? I don't have to. Yeah. So I feel like that's the first thing that they're, they're super into doing because they hate parting with money. And if there's anything that Asian people love to do, it's haggling. It's how you haggle with the government, the IRS. They love that. Sh oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, no, there's no doubt. Yeah, I'm hearing that like at first for people that have never even just like dove in with this with their parents just to have the conversation period about like 
and you, and it's gonna maybe take a like a lot of tries, like a lot of awkward dinner conversations, a lot of that until like you know, like if your parents haven't been talking about this with you, it is gonna take some time to melt the ice, you know. But first things first is just have the conversation about like, hey, what are you? You know, it's like, what have you been doing? How much money do you have? I, and I, I think about this because my family's going through it right now with my parents' generation. My, my grandmother's 98. Uh, like my my grandmother has like some skeletons in the closet or I mean, I'm not sure what you call it, but lots of money that is kind of just like, just like, here's a pocket, here's a pocket, here's a pocket, you know? And then uh, all the, all like the kids and stuff are like, I have no, like, you know, and then you're kind of left scrambling right because she's 98 she's sometimes like some things are true some things are a little bit like miss misremembered mm -hmm. um and so those are kind of the risks that you take if you don't have the conversation early right <laughs> yeah and also um based on my 10 years of experience um if you want to like ask them the hey how much money you have that might be a harder conversation mm -hmm. um I would suggest to think of something that introducing them to ideas, right? Yeah. Mm. And telling them is like, hey, you know what? Um, now that you are out in age, we want to make sure that everything is uh, well thought of. And just ask them, it's like, hey, in, in the future, let's say uh, who among the family you want to make the decision for you, right? Something like that. It could be it could be the dad, the mom, daddy, mommy. It could be uh, elder brother, younger sister, whatever it is, right? Introduce them to that the concept. And then maybe that conversation may or may not go well the first two times, but you, once you actually talk about it, they will start to ask the friends, right? It's yeah. like, hey, what do you think about this? And then it's like, as long as you keep talking about it, not without, you know, like getting to them, tearing them down, it's like break down the wall, they eventually will start to uh, engage in a conversation one way or another. And mm -hmm. you're not, Explicitly asking is more like a soft, dark ask. Like you are not really like, "Hey, how much you have?" Versus like, "Hey, I'm really trying to my best to understand what you want." Totally. Really I, I think when it comes from a place of help or like kind of wanting to fulfill their wishes rather than, I mean, they may be blunt with you for, for the rest of your life. <laughs> okay, you, you can't bring, you, give them that same energy. You're not give them the same energy back. All right, guys, resist. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly what it is. Just be like, I want to like, did you hear that? You know, you could the government takes, you know, this much money, like after you pass away. And there are these like different government programs that you can help us save. You know, I think that might be ap applicable to us. Do you feel like there's any, you know, like, do you feel like there's any applications? Or what do you feel like you want to be doing near the end of your life? Or how do you want to retire? Thanks. Yeah, and, and the worst thing is, um, especially after COVID, like some of our clientele, uh, they are unfortunate to be in this game called treasure hunts, treasure mm. hunts. So after the parent pass away, uh, some of our client parents pass away during the COVID time, uh, not to get into details, but a few years fall, pass, fast forward, they are still in the probate, they are still treasure hunting some of the things that they don't even know if they exist or not. And those kind of thing, it's number one, it put a stress on the generations. And at the same time, now everything that you persevere so much and you're trying to build and help the next generation is like you say, is loss. And there's a rule, especially when it comes to the banking channel, if you don't touch your checking savings account, don't quote me on this, I think it's like about what, uh, 18 to 24 months or sometimes state law takes a longer time. You don't touch it, no activity. You're gonna consider as a state uh, abandoned uh, mm. money, and he's gonna to go to the state, and then until someone starts to claim it over, so those things happen. So yeah. definitely try to have the conversations, and making sure that your elderly understand all of these as well. Yeah, yeah. So you have to gentle parent your parents versus the direct probing, because if you do the direct. Uh, method, you're going to be met with like a Guanli <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like, get out. But you know, part of that too is like, you know, like there's so much shame also built into finance, right? It's like they could not be talking about with you because they have a lot of debt that they're just not really like. I mean, I can imagine a very real scenario where there's like these small business of restaurants or liquor stores where it just they just accrued a lot of debt. 
right? Mm -hmm. um, and they don't love to say, obviously, that they're still in a lot of debt, you know, even after, you know, so many years of being in the business and working so hard. And so, you know, it's just one of those, like, you're going to have, have to have one of those kind of rough conversations or just kind of keep packing at it or else you might uncover something that you need to handle later. And, um, you know, maybe they suddenly pass away or whatever. You may not even know where to even start. Yes. Uh, how funny when I actually mentioned that. It's like I remember one, I forgot which uh, stand-up comedian actually said something very, very similar. And he's like um, saying that, hey, you know what, my parents – come to the state with nothing and then it's like they want me to have the best education so that I can don't live my life like them and then when I actually tell them some of the things that I know and then they give me back the idea of what so now you know you think you know so now you think you know more than me I was like that's the time that you actually bring them to the education in the first place and um Unfortunately, like I say, it's, it's very oxymoron when it comes to the elderly and it's like, what Tiffany say, what I miss? Yeah, it's like, it's, it's pretty much like, hey, it's going to affect me either one way or another now or in the future. I'd rather help you now rather than in the future. But mm. yeah, we don't see for, that way sometimes. For our non-Cantonese listeners, Kwan Lima, you see me as like, what? It's not your, it's not your business. <laughs> Why yeah. are you asking? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Except really mean. <laughs> That's a mean way of putting it. All right. Um, so circling back to the scarcity mindset. So what, what strategies do you recommend to investors looking to overcome the scarcity mindset and adopt a more abundance approach to real estate investing or even conversations with their family? Yeah, I mean, real estate investing, I was going to say that a lot of time, it really depends on what level uh, a person is. And when it comes to scarcity mentality is that you definitely want to make sure that your assets work harder for you and not just eroded by inflation. And mm -hmm. prior to two years ago, the inflation, we talked about 3%. If your money sitting in your mattresses is not making more than 3%, which I hardly think it will, I bet your coffee. <laughs> um, but if that's the case, then um, last two years, the inflation is like about what, seven, eight, nine percent at one point your money is actually losing tremendously faster within the last couple of years. So your $1 in the past, I'm not sure about you both or any other viewers. Uh, far as I know, if I'm going to get a coffee from Starbucks, uh, just a basic coffee, it was like about two, three bucks. I got one yesterday. It was like cost me like five bucks. Same thing. So the, the value of money, if you don't do anything, uh, scarcity mentality is definitely hurting yourself. It's not help hurting other people. So when it comes to investing, whether in real estate or any other uh, investment in any shape or form, always understand this. You will want to do your prudent um, background check and understand what you're investing in. But at the same time, you have to understand that that investing itself is really helping yourself. It's not helping anybody. I love that. There's a time value to money, and that's something that's missing from the equation in this East meets West uh, mentality. Um, yeah. this is, uh, you know, one, we have one more question before we move over to our rapid fire segment, but, uh -huh. um, finally, like what advice would you give to new Asian investors entering the real estate market to ensure they adopt a healthy mindset towards investing? And I think we kind of touched on that uh, in the time valued money, but do you want to expand on that Kelvin? Absolutely. So for anybody who's studying it new, Number one thing I'm going to say is that you really want to explore and stack up your net work because your net work is your net worth when it comes to real estate. A lot of time people think that, oh, I have no money. There's no way for me to invest in real estate. No, the last thing you have to concern about is money because there's always a way for you to finance loans, uh, some deals. But the most important thing is finding the right people that can really truly, truly help you and have their, your best interests at heart, like a mentor, protege kind of relationship, or even it's like a big or small in like someone like um, in the sale group, sale ladies, somebody out there will be able to help and mentor and guide new people. A lot of time, the hardest thing when it comes to real estate is not about money. Unfortunate truth is actually about trust, is how trustworthy uh, a person is to be considered as a big or small partners. So that to me, I've seen it in my own experience. 
Um, unfortunately, uh, some couple of bad views, I think all of us have it, but unfortunately, all of us only talk about our wins, never talk about our losses. So I just want to bring this up. Uh, I lose money in real estate too, in, in the past, simply because I trust the wrong person. So that to me, I just be more cautious on who I uh, deal with, the partners that I work with. Once again, all these are personal experience. Sometimes some people don't talk about it because it's a, it's a, it's a big L, it's not a big W, right? But once again, for somebody who started new in real estate or any other investment, please don't think about the mentality that, oh, I have no money, I'm very little, there's no way for me to get in. That is the furthest thing from the truth. The truth is, as long as you are interested, somebody from anybody in the sale group will be able to help you. Not just the sale group, it's anybody. Like if you go to Tiffany, if you go to Anita, you're like ping them. And I'm sure that they're more than happy to spend about five, 15 to 30 minute phone call just to answer any questions that you have simply because they've gone through that phrase before. So please, 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 if you're thinking about money is the number one thing, don't. Scarcity is the number one thing, don't. Be open-minded, connect with people, have a net worth of network, and that is the first step to any investment. I want to echo that too. I feel like the thing that I've learned as a maturing investor is certainly like, it's certainly that, right? Obviously your, your network is really super important, but trust and also abundance is also really a big part of those learnings. In the beginning, you're going to look at every like, you know, $5,000 loss, $10,000 loss. It's like, oh, you know, I, it, it's, it's like, it sinks in and it kind of stabs your soul a little bit, but think, I think, um, and then, you know, I think as like Asian people, like you're just like, oh, I already lost, you know, like I already lost so much. And you feel the natural abrasiveness of like not wanting to lose more. But in order to be a good, successful real estate investor, you have to just keep moving, right? There are like the abundance mindset. There are more deals out there for me. There are other people I can trust. I can't trust this guy. Maybe this is not the person for me. But there are a lot of deals. There's a lot of people. There are a lot of partners that will work for you. You just have to keep going, right? Um, and I, so, yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things when I see with really young investors is that they just stop when something just it, you lose it or you have a big expense that came up. But if you just think about all the wealthiest people in the world, like just, like yes, we all look at how much money they have made over time, but just think about actually how much they have lost in order to make that those wins right we do not look at those things so 100 and i yeah. just to echo that uh to piggyback there is really no such thing as failure uh, when it comes to real estate life or personal experience career i want to say that nobody mess up any experience is either one of two things either you win or you learn either we win or you learn so that you actually gonna be able to say that, hey, you know what? This is something that I did in the past. It did not work for whatever reason. In the future, I just have to understand that, hey, that is something that happened before, how I can learn from it, either trusting the wrong person, either I did not see the deals numbers correctly, I didn't make the ratios better, or I don't understand the Jacob as I'm meant to be. That is where your network of people is gonna help you. When you face a, a certain situation, you don't know how to proceed, always ask for help. You're not in when it comes to real estate, there's nobody I've seen that can actually do everything by themselves. If there is, that person is a superpower. Uh, even the biggest mogul itself, what they talk about is always leverage. It always use other people capacity, either in their uh, blood, sweat and tears, aka their time, or they're going to leverage their assets or they leverage their connection or their expertise. When it comes to real estate, it's always about other people connecting together collectively to work on a project. And it's also true when it comes to investment in stocks, business, or any other thing. It's always about other people helping you and you helping other people. That's why network is very important. That's so funny because going back to the Eastern mindset, I feel like the old school Asians are very secretive and keep things to themselves. And, and now the ABCs, like the Asian Americans, we're more um, inclined to team up with other people. I think... Um, you know, old school Asians tend to be more insular, um, just to paint in broad strokes. And, and they like to, if they have information, any edge, they'll just be secretive and keep it to themselves. <laughs> and it comes yeah. from this distrust. Uh, but yeah, I, I love that, you know, you either win or you learn. And I, I almost feel like, you know, lear like getting your sea legs in investing, if you're going to lose money in the beginning, it's paying tuition. 
and, and and like we pay tuition to go to college and we learn there. So why not approach it this way? You're either winning or you're learning. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that uh, in life, we're just going to be like, I don't call it like score. I call it experience. Like sometimes when people is like have all the experience in the world and the, the, the conversation you came up from them is actually richer than somebody who would just have all those uh, the glorified moment of winning and then they will tell you about what they lost right yep it's all it's, it's like i think it was in a, the book atomic habits habits if you practice good fundamentals the scoreboard will take care of itself yes absolutely and i would just uh, that's one of the latest book i was reading too <laughs> <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> <Amazing>. <laughs> great read yeah. I also like want to add to that too, is just like, you know, I, I think that failure is always obviously such a really hard thing for as Asians, but, you know, I want to also like circle back to be like, let's draw encouragement from our, our families and our parents, or maybe yourself that did work really hard to, in order to come to this country, right? Oh, there it's like, there's just like certainly nothing as bad as like, I mean, to me, I draw inspiration from my parents who for a time only was eating rice shells because of like, you know, um, you know, when they were in China during, you know, times of famine. And then they always remind me, it's like, there's nothing that's ever going to be that hard. And even though you didn't, even though I didn't experience that personally, I draw inspiration from it because it's like, it's ingrained in your DNA to go through hardship. Like, yep you it's it's in you to to survive the same way that they survive because they are you right they are so so whatever it is like you know it seems hard that building seems too much or the race seems like too big what's what's the worst that can happen <laughs> you know it's just like maybe you move to a smaller house for now you know or whatever obviously don't go crazy but i mean like you know what's the hardest part right you can you have it in your dna to rebuild and we have it in, in our in our DNAs and our heritage to be able to bounce back. Absolutely. And a lot of the time that uh, one thing I was going to say, people don't really care about what you do. And as a matter of fact, they won't be even be there to celebrate until you make it. Right? Mm. Yeah, they were always like, oh, now you're very successful. It's like, hey, tell me about a secret. But when they actually tell you what they're going to do, it's like, no, nah, this is not going to work. Right? A lot of naysayers. Yeah. That's right? funny. I was, yeah, the naysayers. I was going to be like, Anita, your Asian parents encourage you? That's weird. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, they so think, yeah, and then like, when their love language is like scathing, it's more like, like, pa, man. You know, it's just like, it's more like, like that. You know? you whole family. <laughs> Like, it's like, it's like ah, dismiss your emotions, be like, what are you afraid of? You know, I'm like, okay, well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I think that the, the love language of, I can't say all, but most majority of the Asian parents is more like a tough love, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, so it, it's really, really like, once again, it's the eats culture meeting the West. Yeah. I think that it takes, normally it takes somewhere around two to three generations to change a value. So I hope that it can begin with all of us, right? And also teaching our next generation on some an ideology that gonna more make more sense for our generations. Yep. Yep. All right. Ready, Anita? Are you ready, Kelvin? Because we're now gonna jump into our rapid fire question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. All right, Anita, kick it off. Okay, what is one thing a mentor or family member taught you that still resonates with you today? Don't just be humble, just learn, don't forget to ask. And um, that still stays true to me. Who taught, who told you, who taught you that? Uh, this gentleman called Hans Winkler, he's a CFP himself and he's the one that inspired me to become a CFP. Mm, okay, uh, name someone that is doing something awesome that everyone should know. And don't say Rick. <laughs> 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 this brought my whole channel up right there. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it to my wife, Selena. Uh, Selena Lee. Oh. She's also a CFP, and um, I've been together more than ten years. And it's just that a lot of things that we've been through together, ups and down. And she's still there for me, and she still care for me, and for that, I'm grateful for. You're still the one I run to. <laughs> the only one. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 
Um, name a book that significantly changed your career. Um, I was going to say the book, it's actually, it's right here. It's uh, The Greatest Salesman in the World uh, by O.G. Mandino. I'm not sure if you guys can see it. Uh, yep, The Greatest Salesman in the World. Uh, it's not about teaching how to sales. It's actually teaching you everything that you can incorporate in life that include um, you never ask, you never get. And just resonate to what we just said earlier, you never try, you would always have that regrets. Yeah, that resonates. I got to read that one. Okay. What is one habit you have in your daily routine that fundamentally changed who you are as a business person? I recently signed up to have a personal trainer. Um, I start to wake up at 5.30, go to the gym at 6, down it down at 7, and start my day off from there. I try to make it earlier as time goes by, but it really gives my mind less foggy and more energy. All right. Amazing. So that wraps up our segment. <laughs> I want to use that thing as much as I can. I love that button. Uh, Calvin, thank you so much for joining us today and being on the podcast and, you know, you know, sharing your words of wisdom and, you know, uh, pontificating all these old school thoughts with us. Um, the biggest takeaway I got from from this one is, hey, to avoid a treasure hunt, put together a treasure map. And that's where yeah. Calvin and financial planning comes in. You like that? I, I love it. I, I, I think I'm going to start to use that and say that, hey, this is uh, something <laughs> from, from one of my OG. Her name is Tiffany, and you're going to see her. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You, well, you're you not the first person. <laughs> you're not the first person who come on this podcast and just, <laughs> just takes one of uh, Tiffany's puns. <laughs> yeah. I, I really just want to uh, say this uh, as a last uh, thoughts. I really hope that we all on a mission to change that mentality and mindset. Um, not to say that we're going to, you know, go hit butt, but to soften out the ass is really not a direct ass, but also think that, hey, I'm doing this for your own best interest. Instead, just try to say, hey, you know what, this is something that you might want to start thinking, right? Just having that mentality, I think that we all can really change a lot in the coming years and generation. Amazing. Thank you, Calvin. If our listeners want to find you, how can they best do that? Um, you can definitely reach out to us by email is uh, MidasWealth at nm.com. That is uh, Nancy Mary. And for any of the sales uh, community, uh, my partner Rick and I and also Peter, three of us will be able to do a 15 to 30 minute uh, initial consultation. And uh, is whatever you, got, you all want to chat about, we're always going to be uh, putting that as an agenda just to make sure that we are giving back to the sales communities. Amazing. Thank you so much, Calvern. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Anita. Take Thank me. you. It's great having you. Folks. Thank you for tuning in to the Sarah Ladies Podcast hosted by Anita Wong and Tiffany Lee. If you enjoyed our show, please leave us a review or follow Sarah Ladies on Spotify and Instagram. And also click on our show notes to subscribe to our newsletters to stay on top of our news and upcoming events. Until next time, pod squatters. <laughs>